In the far north of Pakistan, on a small hill, next to a huge mountain, there's a unique monument. It was erected in 1953 to commemorate a young American mountaineer, but since then many other names have been added to it. It's a testament to bravery and futility, to ambition and failure, to the fatal attraction of a mountain like none other. The Mountaineer's Mountain, the Savage Mountain, the Killer Mountain, the mountain with no name, K2. Alawuddin, Alawuddin, Walad Shagul Dinar, Muhammad Zaman, Walad Ali, Tudkhor Kalam. Ascoli, Pakistan, July 2000. A group of porters are preparing to take an expedition to K2. For the last hundred years, they and their ancestors have been carrying on their backs the dreams and luggage of foreign mountaineers. Even today, K2 is incredibly difficult to reach. It's over a hundred miles away from the nearest city, and the only way to get there is to make a long trek through the Karakoram Mountains, past some of the most spectacular and rugged terrain in the world. Just to get to the foot of K2 is an expedition in itself. After 70 miles of walking up the Baltar, you go around the corner, wham! Well, awesome is an overused word, but it is awesome. It was first measured by the British Survey of India. They christened it Karakoram II, or K2 for short, and the name stuck. At 28,265 feet, it was the second highest mountain in the world. 800 feet shorter than Everest. It's the hardest and most dangerous. It's orders of magnitude more serious than Everest. So it's, it's the prize. It's the, the, all the serious 8,000 meter mountaineers consider K2 the, the sternest challenge and the greatest prize. At the turn of the century, there were British and Italian expeditions to K2. But it wasn't until the 1930s that the first serious attempt was made on the mountain. It was led by the legendary climber Fritz Wiesner. Fritz was a good climber. He had this love for climbing that, was, that I've basically never seen in anyone else. Superb. He was unquestionably the greatest mountaineer in America. Too good. Fritz Wiesner was a German who had emigrated to America in the late 20s. He was daring and technically accomplished and had astonished American mountaineers by climbing several peaks which had been thought impossible. We would go back when I was a kid to these cliffs. Sometimes he hadn't climbed for 15 or 20 years and he knew all the handholds and he, he'd say, he'd yell down to you and you were uh, he was up above and he'd say, where are you now? And he'd say, well, I'm just right here. And he'd say, oh, look about two feet above and there's a handhold up there. And he really, he had an uncanny memory for these climbs that he'd done and uh, each move that was important on, on the difficult parts of the climb. In the late 1930s, Wiesner secured permission to lead an American expedition to K2. But he wasn't able to go right away. So an advance party went out in 1938 to make a detailed reconnaissance of the mountain. We went out uh, with the stated purpose from the Alpine Club of finding a route on K2. I don't think anybody expected us to climb it. Uh, I'm not sure whether we expected to climb it or not. But at any rate, our purpose was to find the route. 
These were some of the best young climbers in America, and this was a very successful trip. They came back reporting that they'd found a route up K2, and even managed to get close to the summit themselves. But none of them were willing or able to go back with Fritz Wiesner. I have high respect for Fritz. He was an excellent climber. He was not a good leader. Fritz was headstrong. He was dictatorial. He was sure he was right. He was a difficult man to be around. He was hard to climb with unless you accepted his lead, but, but he was a genius. He didn't invite me to go, and I wouldn't have gone anyway. He didn't, if he did invite any of the rest of our expedition, they couldn't go, and none of them did go. So in March 1939, Wiesner set sail for K2 with an untried team. Two weeks later, they arrived in Pakistan and got ready for a long march. They hired nine Sherpa mountain guides and a small army of porters and set off inland. Now Fritz would find out what his men were made of. It was a long and arduous journey. Apart from Wiesner, no one else had been to the Himalayas. Jack Durrance was a strong climber, but he'd never even met Wiesner before K2. The others were either young and inexperienced, or old and inexperienced. Dudley Wolf was the most enthusiastic and least competent member of the team. Dudley's greatest attraction was that he was uh, he brought along a good checkbook. Uh, he was certainly not a great alpinist. Dudley Wolf was a rich playboy who was a romantic at heart. He'd raced boats, hunted big game, and even done a stint in the Foreign Legion. He went to K2 in the aftermath of an unhappy divorce. Things that occupied Dudley were sailing, shooting, and mountain climbing. When Dudley came to Vermont to see my father, uh, you know, in the months before he, he left for the trip, he told us that he was going on the trip. My father said to me then, I don't know why, but I think we'll never see Dudley again. On May the 31st, they arrived at K2 base camp. For Wiesner's deputy leader, Eaton Cromwell, this was the beginning of the end. When Cromwell got to K2, he realized that he was, he was fluff as, a, as an alpinist. And he wanted to go home. And this was a major thing that resulted in problems. His, his attitude was, We're, we don't belong here, particularly me. We don't belong here. I want to go home. But Wiesner was in his element, and he was used to leading from the front. To him, K2 was the mountain of mountains. The most beautiful mountain in the world, perhaps the most difficult mountain in the world. And Fritz really wanted to get to the summit, even if he had a second-rate team. Fritz had thought long and hard about K2. His plan was to establish a series of camps all the way up the route, which had been identified the previous year. They would form his ladder to the summit of K2. For a month, Wiesner cajoled, encouraged and scolded his men up the mountain. But one by one, most of the American climbers reached their limits and retreated back to base camp, suffering from frostbite and altitude sickness. 
To everyone's amazement, apart from the Sherpas, Dudley Wolf was the only man able to keep up with Fritz. It's a funny thing at high altitude that you don't know who's going to do well and who's going to just crap out. It's kind of ironic, but oftentimes a bigger, sort of heftier man actually does better than an athletic, skinnier one. The others warned Dudley that he wasn't good enough to go on. But Dudley didn't want to know, and Fritz was happy to let him carry on. Fritz recognized that, hey, this guy's doing his job. He's strong, he's motivated, and I need these kind of people because everybody else has gone by the wayside. After six weeks of climbing, Fritz, Dudley, and one Sherpa, Pasang Lama, reached their eighth camp and were poised to make an attempt on the summit itself. At this stage, the going got too tough for Dudley Wolf, so he decided to return to camp to wait for the next party of Sherpas. There is no original film of what happened next, but Fritz would remember the events of the following days for the rest of his life. Six in the evening on the 18th of July, 1939, Fritz and Passan found themselves 800 feet from the summit. They had one rock face to go before what Fritz thought would be an easy snow slope to the summit. Then suddenly, Passan stopped. Passan Dalai Lama was very religious and uh, as a Sherpa, he was also a bit apprehensive about the spirits who lived on the mountain, and he was afraid of the night spirits. And he stopped paying the rope out around his waist, and he said, no, Saab, we must come back tomorrow. It's too late. They were 700 feet below the summit, and if a Passang had wanted to go on, they would have made the summit, they would have come down, and it would have been by, what, 11 years, uh, the first 8,000 meter peak in the world to be conquered. He could feel the summit that close, 750 feet of easy climbing, without oxygen. He was in, as he's told me, the shape of my life. He was the, one of the strongest mountaineers ever. modern climber would have said, look, you, you just kind of wait there for a few hours and I'm just going to dash up to the top and get the first ascent of K2 and then, uh, you know, I'll see you in th two or three hours and then we'll go down. But that was something that, you know, you didn't, you didn't do in those days. You didn't do that. Fritz was confident that they could come back for another attempt. But as they were abseiling down, both pairs of their crampons slipped off Passang's rucksack and disappeared into the abyss. Without crampons, it would be almost impossible to reach the summit. So, they continued down. His goal was to regroup with Dudley Wolf, get some more crampons, get some more food, and go up and try it again. But that's not what happened. While Fritz was making history at the summit, down at base camp, morale was at an all-time low. Without radios, they didn't know what was going on above them, and they all wanted to go home. Gradually, their frustration turned into resentment against Fritz. Consider the situation in 1939. Here you have a dedicated Anglophile like Cromwell. After all, that's a good English name. Cromwell is the deputy. The leader is has a very thick German accent. Uh, to his dying day, Fritz carried a very thick German accent. And there's no question in my mind 
that Cromwell felt he was dealing with a master race type person up on the mountain who was who was not necessarily of the same state of mind and probably was subversive. Some Sherpas were sent up to make contact with the high camps, but they came back with alarming news. One of the Sherpas yelled a, a greeting of some kind upwards to try and get in contact with the climbers at the next camp and heard no response. And sometime after that, I think that same day, heard a big avalanche coming down from somewhere in the upper reaches of the mountain. And because of those two events, he surmised that the climbers had been killed in an avalanche and that that's why they didn't answer them. Cromwell wanted to believe that. It was a good reason to go home. But Fritz and Passang were very much alive. They'd rendezvoused with Dudley Wolf, and they were all heading down the mountain looking for fresh supplies and equipment. But when they reached their seventh camp, they were greeted with an incredible sight. There are no sleeping bags in the tent. There are no air mattresses in the tent. The food that was in the tent has been spread out onto the snow. And Fritz just is looking at the camp and saying, my God, you know, how, how could this have happened? Who would have done a thing like this? In his impatience to leave, Cromwell had ordered the lower camps to be stripped, and the Sherpas had emptied the others when they thought Wiesner was dead. You never strip the camps behind the lead climbers. It's, it's not done. It's homicidal. Fritz couldn't believe it. This wasn't what he'd ordered. They had no alternative but to keep on going down. All the way down the mountain, Fritz assumed there were climbers in support. Down, down, down. He has to keep going down, hoping he'll find someone and, and supplies. And all the way back down to base camp or camp two until... I mean, he was stunned by, by what had happened. Two days later, starving and exhausted, Fritz staggered to the bottom of the mountain, where he met Cromwell and some of the others, searching for his dead body. They were ready to go home. They were packed, and, and they were, on, they were all, all but marching down the, down the glacier. Uh, uh, Fritz was livid. What the hell is going on? What, what have you done? What, what's going on here? He was also as exhausted as a man can get. He had absolutely shot his bolt. He was, he'd used every ounce of his energy. Fritz still talked about making another attempt, but everyone could see that he didn't stand a chance. And there was a problem. Fritz and Passang Lama had come down the mountain without Dudley Wolf. He'd insisted on staying put, thinking that Fritz would soon be back to make another attempt on the summit. He didn't realize that he'd be left on his own for a week, the highest and loneliest man in the world. Something was driving him to take risks that were at the limit of his ability to handle them. You know, who, who knows if he actually had a death wish, if he were depressed and decided he wanted to go out on, a, on the mountain. Jack Durrance set off to bring Dudley down, but three days later he came back defeated. So Passang Kekuli, the chief Sherpa, took three men and headed back up K2 to rescue Dudley. They climbed up and they found Dudley alive and weakened, but, you know, relatively okay. He had not been out of his tent, though, in a couple of days. Dudley Wolf had reached a state of apathy in which he couldn't take care of himself. In fact, by the end, he wasn't even leaving the tent to take a shit. It happens a lot in the Himalaya that a climber will reach a state of apathy from being too high too long. The mental process goes bad. You, you get in a dream state, you sort of think, oh, well, I'll just rest a little longer. 
and it's fatal. Dudley Wolf said, I'll think about coming down tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. And so the Sherpas went back down to their camp at Camp 6, spent the night, came back, went back up to Camp 7 the following morning. Only three of them went up this on this particular day. And these three incredibly brave Sherpas and Dudley were never seen again. The fourth Sherpa returned to base camp terrified and distraught. Fritz could barely walk, but a day later he left camp to make one last effort to rescue Dudley. He got nowhere. Suddenly, the weather broke. K2 was covered in snow, and they were forced to retreat. When they were walking away from the mountain, Fritz described this to me, of this awful feeling of, of seeing the clouds, you know, just closing in on the mountain and, and knowing that that was, that was the end of the story. The team, which had joked around on the way out, returned bitter and angry, and in three separate parties. Back in America, Eaton Cromwell accused Wiesner of murdering Dudley Wolfe. And Wolfe's brother Clifford began an investigation into the events surrounding Dudley's death. It came to nothing, but in the winter of 1940, no one had much sympathy for Fritz Wiesner, a controversial German climber. He never, ever got over it. I mean, you could see the veins in his head sort of standing out, and he'd be pounding his fist on the table in his, his office desk, just reliving how, uh, how bad it was, how traumatic it was, you know, 50 years later. There were no further attempts on K2 for almost 15 years. During the Second World War, several of America's top climbers ended up in the military, some developing clothing and equipment for mountain warfare. They'd put it to good use in the decade to come. I'm Charles Houston. This is Bob Bates, and that's our mountain. The film you are about to see is a story of our struggle with this mountain, which took place only recently. I think we thought we could climb it. We had a good team. If we got the weather, we could climb it. I, I, I think we were quite confident. As long as I wasn't married, I was willing to take the risk on K2. If I'd been married, I wouldn't have gone. Charlie Houston and Bob Bates had both been members of the original K2 reconnaissance party. In 1953, they put together a third expedition. They chose their new team carefully, aiming to avoid all the conflicts which had dogged Fritz Wiesner. We did not take some of the outstanding climbers in the United States we did not take because some of them were notable prima donnas. We, we did not take some of the obvious choices because we thought that they would, that they would not get along well. Charlie's whole idea was we're united in what we want to do, and each person uh, has as much right to uh, success or failure as anybody else. We're all in it together. We were just Western boys, and they were <laughs> these kind of luminary figures from the East. Charlie and Bob had the attitude that they wanted to be sure that anybody who was on the expedition would be someone that they'd be comfortable in spending a week with in a tent in a storm. In Pakistan, they were given an ecstatic reception. In the very same week, Everest was climbed, and hopes were high that K2 would be the next big mountain to fall. 
At Rawalpindi, they were joined by the final member of the team, a British officer, Captain Tony Strether. Well, they pulled my leg a bit to start with, obviously, but we all got on very well together. It took them 15 days to reach base camp. For me, it was magic. I think we were all immensely excited. It's so beautiful. The first two weeks were slow but steady. They climbed 4,000 feet up the mountain and set up their first three camps. I think I was in the top shape of my life then because Bob Craig and I were working with the Army, climbing all the time, and uh, in Colorado at high altitude. This is the first exposure to high altitude for me, and so there's always apprehension of what is your body going to do. You would take one step and then a breath, and one step and a breath, and one step and a breath, or even even two or three breaths between each step. So everything is slowed way, way down. When they reached Wiesner's Camp 6, they saw some grim evidence of the 1939 disaster. We did expect that we might come upon the bodies. I was very angry about what had happened in 39. Pasang Kikuli, who had been my friend in 38, he had lost his life due to poor leadership of the expedition. We anticipated we might find some traces of them, and indeed we did. Pete Chilney and I came across the tents, and in it, very, very neatly placed were these three packs, were these can was this can of tea, and everything all set for them to come down. And it was so neat, and it looked just as if it had been left the day before. And that hit me very hard. After 10 more days, they settled into their eighth camp. They were now 3,000 feet and three days from the summit, and spirits were high. We anticipated that we might have a little storm, but then we'd go to the summit. And it was then that we had a, a ballot to see who, who should be the first team and who should be the second team. We had a silent vote on it, and Charlie Houston and I were the only ones with children, so we eliminated ourselves right away. And I, I was, by that time, I was realizing I probably shouldn't even be up here worrying all the time. You can't go into these mountains and think about your family. We chose the teams and settled down, ready to go when the weather broke, but the weather didn't break. In the summer of 1953, the Karakoram Mountains were engulfed by a series of unusually bad storms. For days on end, Houston's team could do nothing but sit it out in their tents. You're being constantly buffeted with a tent going like this, bang, 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 bang. It bangs against your head and bangs against your shoulders. And it makes, and this is what was the most difficult and dangerous thing of all, as far as we were concerned, it was impossible to keep the primer stoves alight. And so we couldn't produce liquid. And at those altitudes, because you were puffing a lot, breathing dry air, you needed an immense amount of liquid to keep the body properly balanced. The storms continued day in, day out. The men became weaker and weaker, and then one of the youngest climbers, Art Gilkey, suddenly fell ill. On the way up, climbing up, he'd complained that he had a cramp in his leg, but he didn't pay much attention to that until maybe a day or two later. 
and then he came out of his tent and fainted. I have a photograph someplace that shows Art coming out of the tent and almost in the position of falling to the ground, which he did. Um, we realized then that we had a serious problem on our hand. We knew that this is no place where anyone can get sick. It was clear that uh, something was wrong with him, and I looked at his leg, and it's pretty easy to make a diagnosis of thrombophobitis or blood clot in the leg. I'd never, I'd never heard of it happening on a mountain. Of course, I'd seen it in my medical career, but I'd never heard of it happening on a mountain. But I knew that it was serious. On the 10th of August, we decided that we'd have to make a break for it because by then he had both legs involved, he had clots in his lung. It was clear that he was going to die if we didn't get down. And so we started down. Charlie said, we've got to take him down. And somebody said, in the storm? And he said, it's life or death for art. Nobody questioned that. They wrapped Gilkey up as best they could and prepared to lower him down the mountain. Their goal was Camp 7, 700 feet below them. According to the textbook, it would be a straightforward mountain rescue. But 25,000 feet up on K2, it was a different matter. They put their cameras away and got ready to face the impossible. After several hours, they were still far from home. As a precaution, they'd split into pairs and were on three separate ropes. Pete Schoening was the anchor man, holding onto a rope connected to Art Gilkey. Pete was preparing to lower Art, and I thought, well, I better hurry down so I can help. And uh, hurrying under conditions like that is not a good idea. His rope slipped underneath Gilkey, and then, but then it wrapped, doubled around the two ropes across the slope. The weight came on the rope. I was just whisked off. I got my ice axe in just as hard as I could. And, of course, the next second I was flipped off. Within seconds, all the ropes had become entangled, and five climbers were flying down K2, held on by just one man above. I could see the rocks coming up at me, and I think my only thought was that, you know, pretty soon I'll, I'll be knocked out, and that's it, if I had any thoughts. Head over heels, head over heels. Uh, no, no particular sensation. I said, well, we did our best, and this is it. The rope came up from below and around behind the ice axe and around my body, around my hips, and was held in my right hand. There is a rock preventing the ice axe from being pulled out from the mountain, and I'm leaning against the top of the ice axe. I do recall a movement, and I knew somebody had slipped. I do recall the rope thinning down. I do recall substantial force on both the hand and your body and the ice axe, and I do recall being very grateful that things slacked off in a fairly short period of time. In an amazing feat of strength and skill, Pete Schoening had held on to all the falling climbers and the injured Gilkey. I fell, everybody fell, and Peter held us. It was an absolutely extraordinary effort on his part. The wounded men struggled over to Camp 7 after securing Gilkey to the slope with two ice axes. An hour later, they came back to get him. We went back to see what we could do for Arthur Gilkey. But when we got back there, there was this extraordinary sight. We had not been able to wear our goggles, our snow goggles, all the day because of the snow 
um, wind and so on. So we were probably all slightly snow blind and so everything looked a bit misty. But Arthur wasn't there and we, we couldn't believe this initially. And then um, Bob Bates belayed me and I went over actually to the spot where he was and it, it looked completely different. There was a sort of gully running down and the snow was all soft round about. An avalanche must have come down and taken him away. By then we knew that we were, our lives were on the line, so to speak. Uh, we had to, we had to keep going, and even though you know, we just hoped that I think individually we just hoped that he hadn't suffered. Well, I think to a large extent, insofar as we were capable of feeling anything, we felt a sense of relief that we wouldn't have to return, well, and with everybody injured or in bad shape, why the thought of continuing to try and lower him down the mountain would have been more hopeless than ever. That night, seven men crammed themselves into two tiny tents high on the shoulder of K2. A few weeks earlier, they posed for the camera, happy and confident. Now, they were lucky to be alive. Charlie Houston had a broken rib and severe concussion. I don't remember the accident at all. Uh, I remember getting to the place where we fell, and then I don't remember that. I remember vaguely the night that we were in the tent uh, it was a terrible night, although fortunately the storm had stopped. And then I begin, I remember the next day. In the gray light of dawn, they started down the mountain. Worse was to come. Very quickly, we were climbing down very difficult rock through blood stains and fragments of cloth and, and uh, tangled ropes, which was where Gilkey had fallen. So for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, we, we all had to climb down through this wreckage. We saw blood on the rocks for a long distance. I mean, splotches here and there. It was plain that he had uh, passed over the route that we were going down no doubt, bouncing along in terrible style. After two more days, they reached House's Chimney, the most difficult piece of climbing on K2. Charlie Houston insisted on being the last man down. I expected him to come right away because he had no pack and he didn't come right down. And that scared the life out of me after I got down, and the others too, and they began calling him to come down. It was my moment of truth, and uh, I, had, I had begun to realize that I couldn't do it. Uh, it was dark, and I was still hurting, and I... Uh, I remember, I remember this much very clearly, but I've never, I've rarely said it. Uh, I remember saying, I'm going to jump off because if I fall down there, I'll knock them down. They're waiting for me at the bottom. And I stood there for a while, uh, just a short while, while they were shouting up to me to come down. And uh, I said the Lord's Prayer and uh, started down, and the next thing I remember, I was at the bottom. There they were. And that was it. A day later, weary and wounded, they were reunited with their support team. We were crossing the fixed ropes above camp too, and the Hunza porters came up on, from below and greeted us at, at the fixed ropes. And they were, it was a very emotional 
experience, a lot of tears. It was really an extraordinary meeting, and they uh, gave us food and drink and put us to bed, and next day we went on down to base camp. It was a wonderful, wonderful meeting. The Portus built a memorial cairn on a rocky promontory above base camp and what remained of Gilkey's possessions were placed on top. Bob Bates said a few prayers, but only four of the others were in a fit state to get there. I don't really believe any of us thought that we could get him down. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody thought about what was going to be the outcome. I think we had made up our minds that we were going to try to get down no matter what with him. But uh, when I think back on what we had to go down, I don't think we had a chance. When they finally returned to America, they were front page news. George Bell froze his feet and uh, had to be carried out from the mountain. He was met by reporters who said, what's it like, what's K2 like? And George said, uh, just instinctively, it's a savage mountain that tries to kill you. So the head headlines the next day was, K2, the savage mountain. Charlie Houston went back to his medical practice, but he was still thinking about K2 and applied for a license to return in two years. But events took a different course. In 1954, a huge Italian expedition arrived in the Karakorum. It was unlike anything that had come before. 700 porters, 16 tons of equipment, three miles of rope, and for the first time on K2, a huge supply of oxygen to get them to the top. There were 12 of Italy's top climbers, chosen after months of rigorous testing, forced to attend lectures on the history of the mountain, vetted by officers from the Italian army. When they reached Pakistan, they made the world's first flight around K2 before setting up camp at the base of the mountain. Their leader, Ardito Desio, said they weren't here to make an attempt on K2. They were here to conquer it. The climbers followed the same route as Houston and Wiesner, establishing camp after camp and forcing their way up the southeast ridge towards the summit. Lino Lacciadelli and Achille Compagnoni made the final push up the mountain and at 6 p.m. on the 31st of July 1954 they reached the long narrow ridge of ice which forms the summit of K2. I got the summit uh, on my knees, but I could see it there, the summit. There was no more to go. And I was in tears, very emotional. I stayed there for several minutes, just leaning against my ice axe to get my breath back. It seemed impossible, but we had made it. Whatever happens next, we reach the summit. We shook hands, we looked around, saw Broad Peak and the other mountains, and we named them to check that we were thinking straight. 
but we never felt truly happy because we knew how difficult it would be to get down. Compagnoni got altitude sickness and he said, I'm tired, I stay here, let's rest here. I said, no, we are going down, and if you don't, I'll give you a bash with this ice axe. We had to be tough on ourselves. So he said, okay, okay, put my gloves on, because neither of us could do it by ourselves. But the left came off and disappeared. So I said, here, have mine. And he said, all right then, let's go. News of their heroic ascent was broadcast around the world. K2 had finally been climbed. I guess, Charlie, you remember the next day rather vividly. Well, we, went, we came back to 6 that afternoon. Fairly Charlie bright. Houston heard about the Italians barely a week before the anniversary of Art Gilkey's death. A year earlier, he'd been high on the mountain fighting for his life. Now, he suffered an episode of total global amnesia. He forgot about K2 and everything else. He forgot who he was, where he lived, what he did. He forgot everything. What happened was I found myself in a town 40 miles from where I lived. Uh, without any identification and not knowing where I was or who I was. And I wandered happily around, uh, went to the hospital. They didn't give me the time of day, but a very sympathetic policeman arrived and, and uh, looked me over, talked to me, and found that a label on my tie that I came from Exeter, New Hampshire, and he called the store and, ident and told them about me, and they said, oh, yeah, that's Dr. Houston. So they sent over and brought me back, and I, it was a period of 24 hours of complete global amnesia. Charlie Houston recovered, but it was a turning point in his life. He went on to become a world expert in high-altitude medicine but one of America's greatest mountaineers never climbed again. Finish. Been there, done that. That was it.